Are you looking to change your car? Do you know your EV from your PHEV or are you considering the MGHS? This video will explain everything you need to know about electric cars and how I can save you over £6,000 on the MGHS PHEV. This is going to be a useful and informative guide on electric vehicles and the MGHS. Informative but long. So I've added sections which you can skip to and from to find the bits most useful to you. And the timings will be in the description. I will mainly concentrate on the HS PHEV. Some of the variants will be similar to a varying degree. So if you are considering a manual or a petrol only, then you may want to speak to your local dealer to find out what the differences are. For instance, with the petrol HS, I know it comes with a sports mode, which the HS PHEV doesn't actually have. Let's start off with an introduction on electric cars. Back in August, I knew I wanted to change my car, but with the UK government stating that a ban on pure petrol and diesel cars from 2030, I really didn't want a traditional petrol only or diesel only car. But with so many terms being thrown around, EV, hybrid, BEV, ICE, PHEV, what do they all mean? ICE is internal combustion engine, a fancy way of just saying your bog standard petrol or diesel car. For example, your Nissan Qashqai or your Ford Fiesta. EV, electric vehicle, or BEV, battery electric vehicle, means the same thing. These are cars powered purely by an electric battery. That's your Nissan Leaf or Tesla. Then you've got your hybrid. That's a car that uses petrol or diesel, but also benefits from added fuel economy because it gains from the energy generated by braking. Regenerative braking converts the energy of deceleration into usable energy to charge the battery using the resistance of the electric motor. Regenerative braking takes advantage of energy that would normally be lost in conventional braking. Examples being the Toyota Prius or the Toyota RAV4. There's the plug-in hybrid electric vehicle, PHEV. This type of car has the best of both worlds as it has an onboard battery that benefits from the regenerative braking of a conventional hybrid. It also has an engine powered by petrol or diesel and also benefits from the ability to plug in to an electric socket to charge the battery. The main disadvantage of a PHEV is that the electric mileage range is much lower than a pure electric vehicle, only up to 50 miles compared with 200 plus miles for a pure electric car. Examples of a PHEV is the Mitsubishi Outlander and of course the MGHS. Obviously, no talk about electric vehicles would be complete without answering the question of what if I run out of battery? That question is defined as range anxiety. I must admit that was one of the questions I also asked. Is it a silly question? Surely it's not easy to run out of battery. Well, according to the AA, in 2020, they attended 13,000 electric vehicle breakdowns and only 4% were because they ran out of battery. A pretty small number, right? Yes, it's quite rare, unless you happen to be stuck behind one. There was a recent incident where a Tesla ran out of battery at Westfield and caused a three hour jam. This photo made this Tesla driver infamous because even though Tesla have a minimum range of 360 miles, they still ran out of charge. Some cars can charge up to 80% in just 30 minutes, so there should be no excuse. So how does the running cost of a petrol car compare to an electric car? Assuming a mile per gallon of 35, which is about average for petrol cars, and a cost of 135 a litre, then cost for 100 miles will be £17.55. My MGHS does on average 27 kilowatt hours per 100 miles, and a home charge cost of 15p per kilowatt hour, then 100 miles will be just over £4. Any other savings? Well, yes. Fuel duty is 57 pence, VAT on fuel is 20%, so VAT is around 25 pence per litre, whereas VAT on domestic electricity is only 5%. Vehicle excise duty is zero, yes, zero. On a PHEV, it's 145 pounds. On my old car, I was previously paying 360 pounds. No wonder the government is facing a potential shortfall of 30 billion as more and more people move to electric vehicles. Another way of saving is to charge up at the free charging stations provided by some supermarkets. 
so far I've seen them at Tesco, Asda, Lidl and Sainsbury's. Certain councils have discounts and exemptions for drivers with electric or plug-in cars. For instance, Westminster Council allow you to pay for 10 minutes but park up to 4 hours. Yep, I've used this a couple of times and each time parking only cost me 83p. Other councils such as Sheffield and Sutton also offer free parking for electric vehicles so it's definitely worth checking out. Well, that's the cost savings of electric vehicles. Are there any other benefits? There's the environmental impacts. According to the US Environmental Protection Agency in 2019, transportation was responsible for 29% of greenhouse gas emissions. Certainly, electric vehicles are not entirely guilt-free, as not all the electricity used is from renewable sources and some may still be generated by fossil fuels. But according to a recent study, a coal power plant is 35 to 42% efficient and gas power plants are 60% efficient. A petrol car would only be 25% efficient. So still a major improvement, right? Let's talk about the charging options both at home and on the street. There are a few main charger connectors in use in the UK and around the world. Let's discuss them and show you what they look like. The one on the left is a Type 1 charger. This is more common in Asia, Japan and the US. It is also found on some of the older electric cars. The Type 2 charger on the right is the more commonly found charger connector in the UK. This is because from January 2013, this was mandated as the official charging type in the EU. The Type 1 charger is used by the Mitsubishi Outlander and some Nissan Leaf cars. Examples of cars that use the Type 2 charger is the MG HS and the Audi e-tron. Another adapter type that you'll see are the CHADEMO and the CCS. These are capable of fast charge and can charge the car up to 80% in around 30 minutes. Cars such as the Mitsubishi Outlander and Tesla use these. There are a large number of street charging options provided by many different companies and these are increasing daily. You even find some chargers trying to pretend to be a lamppost. Here are some of the common ones you will find. You will need to use a dedicated key card or download the app to allow charging. There are also a large number of companies that make and install home chargers and they come in many shapes, sizes and designs. For instance, the Anderson range have so many different models, you will surely find one to match the decor of your house. However, the two main choices you will need to decide on is tethered or untethered, a 3.6 kilowatt, 7 kilowatt or higher power charger. All tethered or untethered basically means is whether you have a cable permanently fixed to the charging unit. This is purely a personal preference. For instance, I chose untethered because my garden is a magnet to spiders and I didn't want to fight a battle with spider webs every time I wanted to charge my car. The next decision is a 3.6 kilowatt or 7 kilowatt charger. The MG HS only charges at 3.6 kilowatts. So even if you buy a 7 kilowatt charger, it will still only charge at a maximum rate of 3.6 kilowatts per hour. However, I did opt to get the 7 kilowatt charger so it's future proof for my next car. You can get chargers faster than 7 kilowatts, but that's probably overkill for home use. To charge the car, insert the smaller of the two plugs into the external plug, then push firmly the larger plug into the car. You'll hear a click, then lock your car. It will start charging, but don't worry, while it's charging, the cable can't be unplugged. The HS has a 16.6 kilowatt battery and charges to full in just over four hours. In comparison, a Hyundai Tucson charges at seven kilowatts, so full will be just two hours. I do agree, it's a slow charge, so maybe one of the disadvantages of the HS. This is the home charger I got from Podpoint. The government currently subsidizes home chargers, so make sure that you take advantage of that. This is how much my home charger installation costs with the additional lock option. All HS cars come with a standard slow charge 3 pin charger, which charges the car in about 8 hours. But when doing research, most people recommended to get a proper charger installed as there is a small possibility that the 3 pin charger may overheat. I don't know if there's any truth in that, but I'd rather be safe than sorry. So what do you think of when I say MG? No, that's MGM. How about this? Or this? Or this? Or these? Some people now think of MG as a Chinese car. Well, 
It technically is, as it's owned by SAIC Motors. But do you think of this as being Spanish or German? How about this? British or Indian? Well, I prefer to think of it just as a car, considering that car parts are made all over the world anyway. So what started out as Morris garages in the 1920s has evolved over the years, making cars like these, to these, to these, and now to the current range that you and I see now, the MG3, the ZS, the MG5, and the HS. Maybe you've seen one of these, or these, or this. Not surprising, as according to the official MG sales figures, which they were kind enough to provide to me, in 2020, in the UK, they sold 18,415 cars, and by September of 2021, they had already sold in excess of 20,000. That's even with the problems of chip shortage and port congestion. Let's look at three of the closest competitors, on the road price, based on similar specs. The Peugeot 3008 GT is 40935. A Volkswagen Tiguan TSI e hybrid is 38960. The Hyundai Tucson Premium PHEV is 39330. And the MG HS PHEV is well 33290. Based on pure price alone, it's a no brainer, right? Of course not. There's other considerations, and we'll discuss those later. Let me start by taking you on a quick walk around of the car. Now, let me show you the external decor of the car. It has LED sequential indicators, which reminds me of this. 18 inch alloy wheels, chrome detailing throughout, keyless entry, heated mirrors. This is the front grille. Daytime running lights. Auto windscreen wipers. And yes, in case you're wondering, I got soaked as I was standing on the side to demonstrate the wipers. Shark fin aerial, chrome roof bars, panoramic sunroof, and a nice little addition that you can only see in the dark. This is what they call puddle lights. I must say, when I first saw the puddle lights, it reminded me of... I find the HS styling reminds me of other similar cars. The rear reminds me of a Nissan Qashqai. The front reminds me of a Mazda CX-5. The HS is quite a round and smooth shaped car and maybe doesn't look as modern as a Toyota RAV4. But who am I kidding? You will be driving it and not looking at it from the outside. So enough with the exterior, let's look at the inside. I have watched other car reviews and they all say a car looks cheap when the inside is all plasticky. Well. This doesn't seem cheap at all. It definitely screams at you luxurious. There's soft padding everywhere. However, one of the downsides of having soft material everywhere is that there's not much places you can put a phone. You can attach it to the windscreen here, or you can put it in the door handle hole here, or you can use an air vent holder like mine. This is good because it's a gravity holder. So it uses the weight of your phone to keep it in place and no need to mess around with the usual grips. Even the door shouts at you good quality. You hear that thud? None of that flimsy tinny sound of cheap cars. This is the center console. You can slide it backwards and forwards so you can rest your arm nicely when holding the gear stick. It hides a little compartment. Supposedly it can be cooled, but I haven't tested it yet. This slides back to reveal two cup holders. Next to the gear stick are some convenient buttons. The boot, turning on the 360 camera, switching between pure electric or hybrid mode, electronic handbrake, 
and there's another button for the brake here. The A button next to the handbrake is a nice feature called auto hold. With this activated, when you stop the car, it automatically applies a brake for you, meaning you can take your foot off the actual brake pedal, and when you're ready to drive off, just press on the gas or accelerator pedal. This is a really helpful function you have got to try. The HS has nice multi-directional turbine air vents, very similar to the ones that you may see in an Audi A3 or some Mercedes. However, I think the MG1 looks nicer. What do you think? Leave a comment down below. The exclusive also has metal sports style pedals. These are full leather seats. On the Excite model, it's leatherette. There's three levers to adjust the seat, backwards and forwards, tilt and adjustable lumbar support with MG styling along the side. Let's take you to the back. It's quite spacious in the back. Rear air vents and USB ports for passengers in the back. Soft touch material here as well. With two ISOFIX fittings. A pull down centre console, which my kids love, that has cup holders and an extra storage. It's large enough in the back for you to step in to fasten the seat belts. Caffins in Ashford, where I bought my car, very kindly allowed me to film and show you the red interior, which is available as an optional extra. I think the red is striking and adds a nice sporty look to the car. It contrasts nicely with the plain black interior. I didn't choose the red interior as we wanted the red paint and red on red is maybe a little too much. But if you choose one of the other colours, the red might pair quite nicely. One thing I want to point out was that I heard having car seats permanently on leather may leave a nasty dent in the seats over a long period of time. So I bought these car seat covers from Amazon. You can get them single or as a pair. Adjustable buckles at the back. A nice strong material. And space for ISOFIX. A pocket at the front for storage and has a non-slip backing. And this is what it looks like with the car seat on it. The rear seats fold down like most cars to allow extra storage. This is what the boot looks like with the seats down. And this is what the boot looks like with the seats up. The PHEV doesn't have a spare wheel as the space is used to store the extra battery. So instead, it's got a tire repair kit and storage space for the three pin charger. Adjustable cover to protect your valuables. If you have tall items, you can remove the cover quite easily like this. You can adjust how high the boot opens in the settings. You can close the boot using this button or use the key fob, but the power tailgate is only available on the exclusive model. Let's have a proper look at the infotainment system now. It's 10 inches, so similar in size to an iPad. It has DAB radio and ability to play music MP3 and video MP4 videos. You can make phone calls by connecting via a cable or Bluetooth. This is the first of the settings pages where you adjust volume. You can adjust the EQ settings. This is the sound stage where you can amend where the sound seems to appear from. It has a virtual subwoofer. I'm no musician, so I find that the speakers on the HS are perfectly fine for me. 
This is the fan and heating menu. Pretty standard options. One important thing I want to point out, if you want the fan or aircon, you can't have the car in pure electric mode. You need to have it in petrol hybrid mode. So I guess that is a little bit of a disadvantage. So that's why I have a newfound love for heated seats. What else are heated seats useful for? Keeping my takeaway warm, of course. Well, it has to be done, doesn't it? The other one I want to show you is the car settings. You can turn the speed information on or off. This is where the camera reads the speed limit on the signposts. The lane assist system. This is where the car uses the camera to aid you with keeping in lane. You can have it to keeping lane so it steers for you. Departure assist or just alert. If you veer out of your lane without using the indicators, the car will either alert you or gently keep you in lane depending on your settings. For this demonstration, I had it on just alert. The forward collision system. I normally have these all on anyway. Let me show you how the blind spot detection works. If you look here near the mirror, there is an orange light. This illuminates when an obstruction is in your blind spot. As you can see, that white car was in my blind spot. And you have comfort and convenience. The HS has a pointless but fun feature called ambient lighting. At night, it allows you to set your mood color in the car. Just move the slider along to pick the color you want. Let's get Becky to demonstrate a few of the colors for you. So we have blue, pink, green, purple, and to red. The follow me home function leaves your headlights on for a short while after you leave the car so you can see in the dark. Find my car. If you press the key fob when the car is locked, it will blink the lights and sound the horn to help you find the car. When driving in petrol hybrid mode, the car can charge the battery and you can adjust the charge settings. Let's show you the 360 camera. The car has cameras positioned around the car that when combined gives a perfect 360 view around the car. You can switch between the 2D and 3D views, tyre views which helps you to avoid curbing your alloys, front view and rear view. The green lines show you the direction of the tyres. Let me show you how the reversing camera and sensor works in practice. The camera comes on automatically when you reverse. and beeps as you get closer to an obstacle. Now the 360 is really good at making sure you don't damage your car or hurt anyone, but the only problem is it doesn't have a record function, so I bought a separate dash cam to protect myself. This is the next base 222X, which I got from Amazon. On the left is the screen and main front facing camera and on the right is an add-on for the rear facing camera. It snaps on and off really easily. Let me show you the sat nav. The system is a bit laggy, especially on startup, but is fine once it's up and running. But I actually like it even though I can use Google Maps as well. Let's show you a dummy search. It is a little bit slow. There's a nice feature in the sat nav I quite like. As you can see, it shows you the house numbers on either side of the road. Quite handy, as sometimes I get to a destination and still need to figure out which side of the road the house I want is. Especially useful for people who do deliveries. Google Maps may have this as well, but I haven't noticed it. Let me show you how the USB works. There's two USB sockets at the front. 
I use one of the USB sockets to store music MP3 and video MP4 files. And the other one I use to plug in my phone for Android Auto or if you have an Apple, Apple Play. So this is one of the videos from our YouTube channel. This is actually 720p but you can actually play 1080p videos on the screen. And this is what the screen looks like from the back. The picture quality actually looks much better in real life. I must admit the big screen was one of the main selling points of the car to me. I test drove a Mitsubishi Outlander. It was a lower spec model and all it had was a CD player. No screen, no sat nav, just a CD player. And let's say I was a bit underwhelmed. I guess not having physical buttons or dials on the screen may annoy some people, but I'll be honest, I would rather have a bigger screen than physical controls. You actually get used to not having controls after a while and you learn the best way of actually navigating the system. Now the video can only be played when the car is stationary and with the handbrake on. So you can watch a video while your other half is out shopping or when charging the car. Now when the handbrake is off, even if you have your foot on the brake, the video won't come on, although you can still hear the sound. What you can do is when you are stuck in long periods of traffic and it's safe to do so, you can tap on the handbrake button like this and the video pops up instantly. And when you are safe to move off again, tap the gear into drive and the screen goes blank again. Let me show you a couple of the functions of Android Auto. If a message comes in, you can get the system to read out the message so you're not caught foul of touching your phone. This is a test message. And you can reply using voice too. Do you want to reply? To make a call, you press here. Call and new. Calling on new. Or you can press here. Call on new. Calling on new. And it does the same thing. Let me show you one of the main features that enticed me to buy the HS, the digital dashboard. Some expensive cars have full digital and some have half digital, but certainly for a car of this price, to have a full digital display is amazing. I really wanted a digital speedometer. I was growing tired of looking at a needle and thinking, am I doing 30, 31 or 32 miles per hour? Getting pulled over when you're maybe two miles over the speed limit is not worth it. I would rather know I'm definitely doing 30 and not guess I'm doing 30. So on the left is the speedo. Then below that, you have the miles remaining on petrol only, miles remaining for petrol and electric combined, total miles done so far. Instead of showing a rev counter, it shows a percentage power instead. Miles remaining on electric power only. If you find the info screens too distracting, you can turn them off. This shows the current journey and you can reset it by long pressing the OK button on the steering wheel. This one shows where the power is going to and from. Let me explain what some of these graphics mean. The first one shows power moving from the battery to power the wheels. This one shows the car using regenerative braking to charge up the battery. This one is the petrol engine providing power with no assistance from the battery. And this one is the engine driving the wheels and charging the battery. For those that are used to seeing a huge rev counter, you will be disappointed. This is the only place you'll find the engine revs, but to be honest, I hardly ever used the rev counter in my previous car anyway. This shows you the power for the regular battery. It displays the tire pressure in bars and the factory default is 2.5 bar in the front and 2.1 in the rear. This equates to 37 and 31 PSI. The screens I use most often are the power distribution and the current journey. And after a month, I still haven't gotten bored of the infographics. It's actually quite fun seeing how economical the car can be. The HS has push button start, so no fumbling around looking for your keys. To start the engine, put your foot on the brake and press the button. The dash takes a few seconds to fully display, but you can actually drive off before the graphics have fully finished loading up. 
unless it's very cold otherwise the car will start in electric mode as this was the first electric car I'd driven when I test drove the car it was so silent when I started the engine I didn't even realize it was on and actually turned off the engine and on again just to make sure so how does it drive well the HSPH EV has a 10 speed auto gearbox you don't notice the gear changes at all even when switching between petrol and electric modes it's just one easy button press to switch seamlessly between pure electric and hybrid mode Another thing you will notice quite early on is the regenerative braking is quite strong. By that, I mean if you put your foot off the accelerator, the car will brake considerably for you. So if you time it right while driving, there are situations where you almost don't need to brake and only need to brake to stop the car fully. Here, I have not applied the brakes at all and the slowing down is purely down to regenerative braking. I only brake just here. When you have the indicators on, the camera will come on and show you a 360 and side view. This can be quite useful, but if you don't like it, this can be turned off. So how comfortable is the car? Well, on the exclusive, the leather seats are made by a company called Bader, which is a famous German leather upholsterer, and you do certainly feel the comfort. It's soft and yet still strong. The suspension is good. Over speed bumps, it could be a bit more spongy, but you will find it's better than a lot of similar cars. It corners well and you kind of forget it's an SUV. It drives and feels like a hatchback or saloon, but just with a higher seating position. The car feels quite nippy and even in pure electric mode, the acceleration is good. To put it into perspective, I used to have a two litre Subaru and first impressions was the PHEV acceleration was actually better. Here are two clips to help show you the acceleration. On the left is a 0 to 30, well 0 to 28, as after that I need to brake so I don't go over the speed limit. And on the right is hybrid mode, where the car uses both the petrol engine and the electric motor to give it a little more oomph. Hopefully you can see the combined power is more nippy. Yes, that was a deciding factor when considering full electric or plug-in. Let's do a quick 0-60 comparison of similar cars. The HS plug-in is 0-60 in 6.9 seconds. The pure electric ZS is 8.2 seconds. And similar size SUVs from Peugeot, Hyundai and Volkswagen are all slower in acceleration. Bet you didn't think that MG was going to outperform the others, even the Volkswagen, did you? Inside the cabin, the soundproofing is quite good. If you do wind down the windows as you drive, you will hear this artificial whirring noise that MG has created to alert pedestrians of your presence. Let me show you one of the nifty little functions this car has. It's called Adaptive Cruise Control. Adaptive Cruise Control will drive at your set speed where possible and maintain your set distance with the car in front. At low speeds, an easier way of thinking about it is traffic jam assist. So if the car in front of you moves, you move. If the car in front of you brakes or stops, you stop. All without you having to apply the brakes. But I still keep my foot near the brake as a precaution. This is all possible because of this radar sensor here. And this camera here provided by Bosch. Now would be a good time to talk about fuel economy. The official quoted is 155 miles per gallon. And based on my driving so far, the battery efficiency of 27 kilowatt hours per 100 miles, I think that's certainly achievable. I also did a test so I can show you on the video the fuel economy from the petrol engine. I ran the battery down to 0% and then did a test drive under city conditions. The car still did around 60 miles per gallon. I think this is because even though the battery was showing zero, there is still some residual charge and the car was still benefiting from regenerative braking. Now would be a good time to show you the safety aspects of the car. How safe is it for you as a passenger? Euro NCAP, which does a lot of the industry crash tests, were kind enough to let me use their footage to show you the safety of the HS both in and out. It received a full 5 out of 5 for safety when it was tested in 2019.
looks pretty safe to me. At least I have confidence that my family will be protected in the event of an accident. However, I can't say the same for the car. Ouch. That was the safety inside the car. Let's now look at the safety from the view of a pedestrian. You will notice that the car's automatic braking works reassuringly well. I've added a section for hints and tips. These are things that not everybody knows about, but is definitely handy to know. Tip one, did you know that when you buy a new MG, you get free AA roadside assistance? No? Well, neither did I when I bought the car. I only found this out when doing research for this video. Yes, you get one year's AA cover and not the cheapest bare bones cover either. It's the full bundle of Homestart national recovery and onward travel. I did a quote on the AA website and for this level of cover it would normally cost £179. So what do you need to do to get this cover? Nothing actually. When you buy the car MG automatically registers your details so if you have a breakdown all you need to do is call the breakdown assist number and give your vehicle information. They will have all your details already. And another added bonus for every year that you get your car serviced by MG your AA cover gets renewed too, which leads on to the next positive. All new MGs come with a seven year warranty. So if anything goes wrong with the car, you have absolute peace of mind. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know other car brands also do warranties with their cars, but let me break it down for you. Hyundai warranty is five years. Peugeot warranty is three years. Volkswagen warranty is three years as well. I mean, can you imagine buying a new phone and them giving you seven years warranty? Yeah, right. You can dream on. So I guess MG believes in the quality of their cars. The warranty is also transferable when you sell the car. So I'm sure that will help residual values too. Now, the only caveat I could find was that to maintain the warranty, the car needs to be serviced by MG. Now, I've always thought that servicing by main dealers were a bit on the expensive side compared with my local garage. But with the fact that I learned I get free AA as part of the deal, it certainly made it easier to swallow. Oh, and one last thing about the warranty. You get a free bear with the service. Yes, I know. It's not much, but free's free. And my daughter has already reserved the first one. Tip two, when charging your car, I'm sure there will be times you will be wondering how long there is left before it's fully charged. I thought the only way to find this out was to open the door, start the engine and then bring up the digital dash. But this little tip was given to me in one of the forums. With the car locked, make sure you don't have your car keys with you. Press and hold the car door button like this. And after a few seconds, the digital dash comes on and tells you what the percentage charged is. Tip three. This is a nice handy tip. You know in summer months when you leave your car in the sun for too long, by the time you come back to it, it's blistering hot. Well, this tip means it's less painful. First, unlock the car, then hold down the unlock button for six seconds. And then, hey presto, all the windows and sunroof all open. So you can let the car cool down a bit before you start driving off. And to do the reverse and lock everything, hold down the lock button for six seconds like this. There you go. Everything closes back up. And the best tip of all, how I and you can save over £6,000 on a new HSPHEV. Let's start by going through the dealer's on the road price. The dynamic red, the original MG charging cable, and that brings the total up to 
33516. Now let's look at how we can save you some money. MG do a scheme called MG Affinity, which gives you big discounts off a new MG. Some other car brands do a similar scheme too. It's available to mainly public sector workers and the immediate family, although they do say that local businesses can benefit too. So if you fall into the latter category, it's worth speaking to your local dealer. No harm in trying. Back to the list of qualifying occupations. As you can see, if you work for any of the emergency services, armed forces, as well as teachers are covered. In addition, anyone who works for the public sector, this could be central government or local government. For example, your local council workers are all included. The scheme also covers your immediate family, so your partner or your children. If your parents are public sector workers, it's also worth checking if you qualify. It's a very straightforward process and all they need is your ID card or a recent payslip. That's it. So what's the saving? Let's look at the figures again. So the normal price is 33516. Let's see what you get knocked off. You get free pearlescent paint. So that's your white or metallic paint. So that's your black, blue or red in the current range. A free type 2 charging cable, which you don't normally get. A discount of over £5,000. So the total I paid was 27032 A total saving of £6,484. Now how many car dealers can you go in and say, I want your most expensive car with all the toys and walk out with change for under £30,000? Not many. Final thoughts. As you can tell, I really like the car, but obviously no car is perfect. And although I do like it, there are certain, I wouldn't say flaws, but certainly little niggles. Let me share my top three positives and top three niggles with the car. Definitely the digital dash. It's fun to see the graphics and I like the digital speedometer. The big screen. Yes, I know some people might rank this quite low, but to me, it's a big positive. And the last one, Although I wanted to say the auto hold function, as I find it really useful, it would have to be the 360 camera. Why? Because I've had the car for two months, I haven't even curbed it once. For me, that's quite remarkable. And the 360 camera is really good. Okay, now to the niggles. The windscreen wipers don't overlap. So after doing a wipe, sometimes there is a small streak at the bottom of the screen. Not the end of the world, but a little annoying. For the eco-conscious, you can't have the aircon or heater on in pure electric mode. So if you want to properly demist the windscreen, you will need to go in full hybrid mode, although you can switch straight back to electric once it clears. For such a well-equipped car, it doesn't actually come with mats or wheel locking nuts. Yes, I was really surprised about this one. I'm not sure if this is standard industry practice. As usual, comments welcome. Supposedly, people don't tend to steal alloy wheels anymore. They are more likely to cut your exhaust off, so maybe that's why. As for the mats, the great guys at Caffins in Ashford, where I bought this car, Paul and Joe have promised that if you mention this video when inquiring about a car, they'll include original MG mats as a bonus. I guess it's about time for a disclaimer. I was not paid by MG or Caffins to do this video, although it would have been amazing if they did, as this video took over a month to film and edit. Okay, now for the final thoughts on the HS plug-in. As you can see, I considered the alternatives and for similar specifications, you'll be paying a lot more. If you are after a new SUV or plug-in, seriously consider it. If you're considering full electric, then the MG ZS is similar, although in my opinion, the HS is bigger and better spec. Okay, that's all there is. If you like the video and want to show your support or appreciation, no need to buy me a coffee. A like on the video and a subscribe will be very much appreciated. And please share any comments, good or bad, so I know whether to do any more videos of this type, as it's not my usual topic. Thanks for watching.